So in 2023, we saw a record high single night of homelessness with um, over 650,000 individuals It's experiencing homelessness on a single night in January. It's the point in time count. They do that one a year, which that was a 12.1% increase from the previous year. From the years 2019 to 2023, the number of people who entered emergency shelters for the first time increased more than 23%. Um, also in 2023, a record high 256 plus thousand people experienced um, being homeless and unsheltered, which is almost 40% of all people experiencing homelessness and over 50% of those who are just individuals. So some of that you know, 40% is families, but over 50% of individuals being counted were unsheltered. And while homelessness impacts people of all ages, races, ethnicities, genders, and sexual orientations, it does disproportionately impact some groups and populations at a higher rate. Um, compared to the portion of the US population, they make up individuals of color, for instance, are overrepresented in the population experiencing homelessness. So this is obviously a, a very persistent problem throughout America and um, something that obviously those of us who work in integrated primary mental health care need to be aware of. In Ohio, um, we're certainly not the worst place in the country, nor are we the best. In just the Akron, Barberton, kind of Summit County area, on the point in time uh, count, it was about 650 individuals experiencing homelessness on that given night, and over 12,000 or over 11,000 individuals throughout all of Ohio. Um, Ten people experienced homelessness out of every 100,000 within the population, and within that. Uh, Akron, Barberton, Summit County area, that was just a little bit higher. Part of the reason that we wanted to talk about this today is because there was a recent uh, Supreme Court, I guess a couple months ago, a recent Supreme Court decision, um, Johnson, Johnson versus Grants Pass, that was, a ruling was made back in um, June and it changed the potential landscape for those individuals experiencing homelessness throughout the country. Not in every state, but it certainly changed the potential landscape. So Johnson v. Grants Pass was a court case originally filed back in 2018 that determined it was cruel and unusual punishment under the Eighth Amendment to arrest or to ticket people for sleeping outside when they had no other feasible safe place to go. It's Johnson versus Grants Pass because it started in Grants Pass, Oregon, when the city began issuing tickets to individuals sleeping in public, um, even when there was not safe, accessible, or sheltered, safe and accessible shelter beds for them to go to. Grants Pass, Oregon is a smaller town of about a little under 40,000 individuals, and about 600 of those are estimated to, be exp to experience homelessness on any given day. And like many local governments across the U.S., Grants Pass has had made public camping laws that restrict encampments on public property. So initial violations might trigger a fine where multiple, multiple violations can lead to arrest. So there had been a prior decision, Martin v. Boise, um, where the Ninth Circuit Court held that the Eight Amendments Cruel and Unusual Punishment would bar cities from enforcing these kinds of public camping ordinances when there wasn't any other practically available shelter beds. Um, there was a punitive class act lawsuit, lawsuit filed on behalf of homeless people living in Grants Pass, claiming that the ordinances violated the Fifth or the Eighth Amendment. Um, the court argued that, well, the Supreme Court ultimately argued that cruel and unusual, unusual punishment clause focuses on the question of what kind of punishment a government may impose after a criminal conviction, and not whether or not a government may criminalize a particular behavior in the first place. So they ruled with Grants Pass, meaning that individuals experiencing homelessness can be fined or arrested for sleeping outside. Um, people experiencing homelessness experience a wide variety of pre wide variety of pre-existing possible health issues, and the health of the homeless is certainly something that we need to be highly concerned about. Um, Living homeless or unsheltered can lead to a number of health conditions and can exacerbate skin, various conditions. Um, things noted in the literature include skin ulcerations, respiratory problems, bodily injury. Um, the literature also notes that homelessness is both a cause and consequence of mental health challenges. 
um, depression, suicidality, trauma, substance use disorder, and serious mental illness are all disproportionate within homeless populations, although the numbers of exact individuals are a little bit all over the place, depending on which literature you look at. Lack of access to health care and health insurance is also a very big issue. So when, it, when we think about the Grants Pass case, um, this, beca this becomes kind of, it becomes an issue because on one hand, the majority of the court said that the Eighth Amendment does not apply here, um, where uh, various, a couple of the judges actually disagreed with this, um, noting that this does not provide a, a good alternative for individuals who they did know to be disproportionately impacting, impacted by a variety of health and mental health conditions. So again, the, the majority said um, the court doesn't have a space to dictate the nation's homelessness policy, while Justices Sotomayor, Kagan, and Jackson all dissented, arguing that the majority's ruling leaves those vulnerable um, with the impossible choice of either to stay awake, stay moving, or be arrested. Various groups throughout Ohio that work with homeless populations are um, upset about the Supreme Court ruling. So this is a statement from that Coalition on Housing, on Homelessness and Housing in Ohio, um, who agrees with Justice Sonia Sotomayor's dissenting opinion that sleep is a biological necessity and not a crime. Um, and for some individuals, sleeping outside is their only option. And for people with no access to a shelter, the pun this could punish them for being homeless and that this should be considered unconscionable, unconstitutional, and tantamount to cruel and unusual punishment. Some additional local comments um, came from uh, you know, local folks in Akron and Northeast Ohio, um, really just pointing to the fact that criminalizing homelessness, criminalizing poverty is quite cruel and inhumane and not something that our local organizations agree with, um, and so they'll certainly be trying to push back on any local ordinance ordinances, but even as early as July 3rd, the Chillicothe police had intensified efforts to address homelessness um, and were starting to issue tickets and violations. This slide did not come out quite as I recalled that it would, so I apologize for the overlap here, but this is a map of some pending legislation or past legislation in various states that will further criminalize um, homelessness, um, being unhoused. And the folks that look at this from a policy level point to, you know, Victorian era, era vagrancy laws and to Jim Crow laws as the origination of many of these um, criminalization of homelessness types of initiatives, which we can all see how those would be kind of a step backwards from where we've been pushing as a society. So Doug, I'm gonna mute myself. You just tell me when to progress. All right, I'm unmuting. Uh, so yeah, so that was excellent, thank you. So yeah, we, when uh, Nicole and I decided to talk about this, it was really because uh, of the new legal case that came up. And so we wanted to walk through, I'm going to do more of the, what are we doing about it right now in Summit County component. Um, and obviously the basis of this is you've heard things like housing first initiatives and so forth. And the concept here is really based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which we have on the screen here. And at the very bottom of this is food, clothing, shelter, right? The basics that if you don't have that, when you wake up today, you're going to spend your whole day focused on obtaining such things. You're not going to be able to work on getting a job or other types of things, getting your health care, your mental health care, what have you. You're going to focus on survival. Uh, so housing really is part of survival. And I think we, all of us on here are, I'm sure, in some fashion housed. And the reality is, if you really didn't know where you were going to lay your head tonight, you would be very stressed, right? Your day would not go the way it's going right now. Uh, and so that really is a piece that I think we forget. It's easy to forget that uh, those of us who work in this space try to help people uh, with their uh, um, emotional issues, psychiatric issues, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all of us really probably on this on this Zoom. So uh, next. So uh, Summit County, we, we do a lot of work through the ADM board. 
Uh, we have our new logo on there. Uh, pretty new. We just got our t-shirts this week, in fact. Uh, so we've rebranded a bit, uh, a little more colorful and so forth. And we do a lot of work in this space. So uh, Holly Cundiff, who's at ADM board, she is aware of all of the adult care facilities. Some call those group homes uh, throughout the county. I believe she's actually now visited all of them. Uh, we watch them. They are licensed by Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. So there are some standards. Uh, obviously, we we don't want, uh, in, in the old negative phrase, slumlords, that kind of thing. We want solid housing for these individuals. And ADM is part of that process. Uh, Holly also serves as our client rights officer. So any concerns that come up uh, or anywhere in the system, not just about housing, uh, come to her. And then in some cases, she'll talk to uh, our executive director, Amy Wade, or myself, uh, or others, depending on what's going on. And of course, we're there for promoting housing initiatives like Housing First. Uh, and we do provide funding that goes into this space. And I'll get to that uh, a little bit later here. Uh, I think oh, Nicole and I promised to be done by about 2.30 today. So, um, and then, uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, and then we do have the Access to Wellness Fund. So I wanted to mention that here. This was really a great innovation from the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Um, and the concept here is that there are individuals who get hospitalized uh, too frequently. Uh, and it started actually when we, they initially launched this a couple of years ago as four hospitalizations in a year. Uh, they have relaxed that to four, two hospitalizations in a year. So it hits a broader group of people that way. And it allows us to to give up to $8,000 for whatever they need. Uh, the I think the only thing on the list you can't provide this money for is buying a car. Uh, but in, in reality, if we uh, ended up needing to pay their rent so that they can make a monthly car payment, that would be allowed. So that really, this is about as flexible dollars as you can have, because it's really a minimal amount of money. If it avoids even one hospital stay, you've saved your money as a, as a broad system, uh, which is really uh, thinking outside the box, right? Everybody wants to have their lane paid for, and that's how everybody budgets. But this is really about, let's not think that way. Let's go beyond that. Um, and it's been very, very valuable uh, for a number of uh, individuals in the community who have been able to remain in the community, uh, meaning not in the hospital, but also not in jail, yeah, because they're not uh, trying to meet survival needs. Uh, and honestly, I think most of us, if you really were in survival mode, you would do things that might not be legal to try to survive. So we don't want to avoid that. We want to take that out of the equation for individuals uh, who in, at times may not be thinking clearly or their emotions may be clouded uh, by uh, their illness. Uh, so very, very valuable. Next. Uh, so uh, one of the places we have in the community that it's been there a long time now uh, is the Haven of Rest. And I, I put on here more uh, than a shelter because uh, I've had, I've toured it a couple of times myself. Well, probably more than that, probably five times or so. Uh, several of those times was with residents, uh, the uh, Suma Neomed residents, uh, because they chose to do that in the third and fourth year. I give them an option of a, of a field trip and they've chosen to go there. The different groups have chosen to go and it's quite impressive. Uh, it really is. It's a. It's a. It is Christian based, but they they take everybody. Uh, there's no exclusion criteria around religion. Uh, it's really just to give them a framework that has worked for them for eight decades. Um, and the concept here is is they really do. They've got very nice. Uh, it's a nice shelter, if you will. Actual nice beds in bedrooms. Uh, they're not all in one giant aggregate uh, room, et cetera, et cetera. They have a huge. Uh, cafeteria area with a, a very solid uh, industrial kitchen, uh, which was renovated actually in the recent few years. Um, and you can see here since 1943, so right as we ended uh, World War II, uh, this evolved into everybody, men, women, children, so families can stay there. Uh, I believe they do actually set it up so that men are in one area, women and children in another uh, because otherwise you'd have a lot of men around other people's children. I think they, they and, and around women. So I think they've separated it, uh, again, somewhat along Christian lines uh, to avoid some of those potential problems that could occur. Um, look at what they did in 2023. Obviously, we don't have 24 numbers yet. So they had 45,000 nights of shelter for people. They provided over 120,000 meals. Uh, they have a huge clothing setup. In fact, I was just in a meeting yesterday at SUMA, 
and one of the psychiatrists in the meeting said, oh, I've got to make a drop off on the way home uh, and dropping some clothes off at the Haven of Rest. So they will accept your donations. Uh, they launder them, they sort them, uh, and then they put them in their shop uh, and they make it uh, very much of a value add for individuals, not just people in the shelter, anybody can come in uh, there who, who needs help with clothing. Uh, impressive, very impressive. Um, they do a lot of education. So if people are gonna stay there, uh, and they may stay there for an extended period of time, uh, then they can get their high school diploma. They can work on a GED. They get Microsoft Office training, which in today's world uh, is really important uh, to have a job. Almost every job requires you to do something uh, in Microsoft Office, even if it's as simple as Word. But a lot of uh, organizations, mine included, use Outlook uh, for scheduling and calendars and, and uh, emails and the like. So very important that they work with individuals to help them be prepared. They also do resume building. They do all the stuff you'd expect uh, that people would need to accomplish this. Uh, they do also have some, uh, I don't have it on the slide, they do have some uh, services there through uh, some excellent social workers and the like to work with people around any mental health type needs to help them get tied into other uh, settings. They uh, have these hope totes uh, personal care items, so the kind of things you would need to brush your teeth and uh, that kind of thing. You can get those there. Uh, they will distribute them uh, to individuals who are homeless and not not in the shelter because they provide them in the shelter, but outside the shelter. Uh, they've got camps, so, so they're trying to break the stigma, if you will, of the of the shelter and say, look, housing is important, and we want to make we want to have positive housing. Uh, they, they also in the community they have a big picnic every year. Uh, Uh, and so they have those big meals uh, that anybody can come to uh, to uh, provide that some ongoing tradition and culture and so forth. So again, you see here aftercare programs and alumni associations. So you've, you've left there. Maybe you did manage to use that resume to get a job, but you still need uh, that connect, social connection, uh, which you may have lost when you were homeless, right? So uh, we know through the Surgeon General's recent report about isolation being a problem, uh, akin to smoking in terms of negativity on your health. So having that social connection ongoing is very, 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 very important. Uh, next. So then we have uh, community support services. So uh, real quickly back in, I think it was 1989, before my time, obviously, you know, even in Ohio, um, the uh, Summit County basically designed the system. And so Portage Path, you've heard a little bit about because they have the, the excellent uh, fellowship program for advanced practice uh, nurses. They uh, were created to serve, in effect, everybody other than those with serious and persistent mental illness. Um, and there's obviously overlap there for the different individuals, and some do go to both places. CSS was created for people with particularly with serious and persistent mental illness. And today that translates into a lot of the services they do, including housing. They have been for many, many decades now the experts on housing uh, for individuals with mental illness uh, in uh, Summit County. So they're, they're the best at this uh, of anybody I've seen. Uh, so they have a very large homeless outreach program. Uh, they have a veterans uh, a safe haven type place. They have an ability for individuals who are homeless to go in and shower, uh, do their laundry, take a load off in comfortable seating. So this, again, one of the things, if you imagine living uh, in a homeless setting, what do you do about that? How, how do you deal with your clothing? How do you deal with some shower uh, ability to take care of your hygiene periodically? You don't even have running water, uh, right? So this is an amazing uh, thing I just saw, by the way, another uh, item that's coming out. I think it's through United Way. I won't swear, but I just literally saw it yesterday pop up. And it's a new mobile van that goes around to allow individuals to take a shower. Uh, so it's set up to go out in the community uh, so people can actually take a shower. I don't know the exact target audience on that, uh, but that's brand new. So again, more ideas that might help uh, individuals who are currently homeless uh, to at least maintain some dignity uh, while they're trying to obviously get out of that situation, or at least uh, many of them are eventually trying to. Um, they do have a team uh, that go out into the community. They go anywhere on the street. They go to the so-called tent cities and, and wherever else. And the concept here is 
to provide the resources, but also encourage these individuals to come get more care. Um, uh, CSS has a broad range of care all the way up through it, including the assertive community treatment teams, the ACT teams uh, for people with serious mental illness, and they have therefore a lot of resources to bring to bear and to tie them to all the resources in the county uh, through 211, uh, United Way, et cetera, ADM board, agent, other agencies like Portage Path, et cetera. So uh, it really is a robust program. It, uh, I would uh, an anal analogy to needle exchange programs and substance use where you're giving them clean needles, you're serving a purpose, you're avoiding illness and disease, uh, and disease infection, but you're also saying to the person, you know, if you'd like more help, we have other help for you. And eventually some of those people do end up coming into substance use uh, treatment. And same idea here with the mobile outreach to individuals who are homeless who may today not trust them and may today not want any services because of that lack of trust, but in six months, they may say, I'm ready. You've come here every week or every other day. I get it. You really are uh, pure of heart, and I'm willing to accept uh, the help. So that's excellent. Uh, they do have, again, these safe haven programs, the one for veterans. They have uh, two for individuals with serious and persistent mental illness. And these are different. And I, I apologize. I think the safe haven is misplaced here under the center. That's not this one, uh, but they have a, these safe havens. So these are places that have been uh, designed. It's a traditional uh, tenant landlord lease. So they, it really is their place. Uh, they are renting. It's their home. Uh, they have to pay 30% of their income towards the rent. So there's it's a sliding scale uh, to give them that ability. If you think about it, uh, anybody of you have ever considered purchasing any kind of property like a home, uh, there's a limit uh, the way the banks loan money, except for when we had the horrible bubble experience, but that, that when they went beyond that, was, that was actually the problem. They limit, they usually talk 28 to 30 percent of your income at the most that you should be spending on housing. Otherwise, uh, you will be house poor and then other things will be lost. You won't be able to pay for medications, food, etc. So that's the concept here of teaching them as well to do this in a positive way going forward. Uh, next. Um, okay, so I won't belabor this because you'll get the slide set. But basically, I think they're already loaded, actually. I, I think uh, Nicole already put them on there. So, uh, But a lot of residential treatment uh, at three different locations. Uh, this one does include uh, some activities where the residents really have their own community uh, government, if you will, uh, to help make decisions about this. Um, they do have to participate in programming. So the idea here is more for people with mental illness. Uh, to give them that programming uh, alongside the residential treatment. People do stay about a year. Uh, so this is a, a pretty good, solid, lengthy program. Uh, I've mentioned the group homes. We have a lot of those in Summit County, thankfully. Um, returning Home Ohio is a connection from the prison system. So, of course, individuals who go to prison, you all know that prisons and jails house many more people with mental illness than hospitals. Uh, so when people come out of prison, there's a good percentage of them who do, in fact, need help with their mental health, as well as housing and things of that nature. So uh, Returning Home Ohio is a program to allow for that. And then the Akron Metropolitan Housing Authority. So you may have one of these in each of your areas. If you're not in, in Akron, uh, does help individuals apply for certain types of housing. So if they're if they meet the criteria for a senior program uh, or there's housing choice vouchers, that help uh, defray some of the cost uh, to, again, help people to not be homeless. Next. Um, and then finally, these are amazing. Uh, so I put these last on purpose. Um, what CSS started doing in the last decade um, is amazing. So they worked with uh, funders, They ADM is at the table as well. Uh, they worked with builders. And they created these buildings that are beautiful buildings. I've toured them and was, was almost in tears as one of the tenants uh, proudly showed me, her, me and several other people, uh, her apartment. Uh, she had been homeless for six years and finally had a place to live. Um, anyway, I was, I'm tearful thinking about it. It was amazing just to watch her pride in having her own space, right? So... They have now at Madeline Park, actually two, I think, 60-bed buildings, but they've got amazing apartments. That's the one that I toured. 
Um, all of them were formerly homeless. They do they did set aside a certain percentage of the apartments for veterans, uh, homeless veterans. So they also are housed there. Uh, and then they give them case management. They give them peer support services. They give psychiatry and counseling. So it really is uh, one stop shopping. Uh, so on the first floor, there's some spaces for uh, this kind of uh, treatment and recovery uh, resources. Uh, as then they have their own apartments and so forth. And then Stony Point, I think, actually came second. Uh, so that is a little over 100 one-bedroom apartments. Again, mostly targeted toward homelessness uh, and then veterans. Uh, very modern. Uh, they've got the uh, the radiant floor heating, uh, very nicely polished floors and so forth. So uh, radiant floor heating, in, in this case, is more green anyway. So it's, it's an energy saver. Uh, so that's good for everybody, including the community. Um, and then they do have a 24-hour uh, service there, and they've got computer labs and social services, et cetera. Uh, so these individuals can live uh, very comfortably. And ultimately, of course, the goal is that many of these people may move on uh, to other housing uh, if they're, uh, they build their skill sets and, and so forth. So that's that's an amazing one. I'm sure they'd let people tour that if you had interest. Our most uh, recent one that is now opened, actually, just you see here in August, just ap just happened. Uh, we had a nice ribbon cutting. Uh, the sheriff spoke. Uh, our director, Amy Wade, spoke. Uh, Keith Stahl, who's the head of the uh, housing initiatives at CSS, spoke. A number of people spoke. Some, uh, some uh, uh, other dignitaries spoke from the government. And so it's called Thrive House. So in the jail, the Summit County Jail, we already have a Thrive program. Uh, transition, help, restore, independence, value, and power. So it's not a sentence. It's a, a bunch of uh, important uh, adjectives here in terms of what people are doing. And this has translated now. Of course, it took time to get it renovated, but a, a building that was renovated, again, ADM was at the table for this as well. You can see the partners at the bottom there. Uh, the land banks are always very important, these things. They're the ones who know where the the housing is where, what What are the rules and regs, what's the zoning, all this kind of stuff. Um, so they were very much part of this as well. And then again, CSS runs this. Uh, so uh, beautiful, beautiful renovated new space. We get to have a tour after the ribbon cutting um, and they were help people work on their treatment goals, uh, right? So case managers coming in. So they're coming out of jail and this allow this they've probably received a certain amount of treatment in the Thrive program in the jail, uh, and then they're coming out, and this is to help continue that process uh, so that they have the best opportunity to become fully independent. You can see independence here as part of that goal, uh, and of course they will then leave the Thrive House, and other people will come into the Thrive House uh, to get uh, help in the same way. So again, helping people get to a point where they can live independently. Uh, not homeless, uh, and avoid jail and hospitalization. That's uh, always in the same direction. Next. All right, and coming soon. Uh, we are actually October 3rd. We will have a groundbreaking. Uh, so we've been working on this for a while uh, with uh, Haas and Staub, excellent architects in this space. Uh, they actually helped design North Coast. Uh, they helped design the new Metro Health uh, pavilion. They helped design the Suma Juvie Pavilion, a number of other places around the state. Uh, this I this may be their, their first official residential, uh, but it's tied to all the, the same psychiatry, mental health type uh, resources. And so the goal here will be people coming out of inpatient hospitalization, psychiatric hospitalization. Um, mostly that's going to be Suma or Cleveland Clinic Akron General, uh, generations. We have people from our county go there when they can't get into the other two. Uh, as you know, it's very hard to get in the North Coast, so it won't, it won't be a lot of people coming out of North Coast, uh, which is unfortunate uh, because it's going to be built on the grounds of North Coast. <laughs> so, uh, so anybody who's familiar with the state hospital, uh, where I actually was for, for many, many years, um, they have uh, there's a, a lot of space there. The, there used to be a building called Building 22. It's probably still on Google Maps because that that's always lags, looks like a spider. That's gone, it's all field now. And further down the road actually will be, so even, even further from the main building now will be the Dr. Fred Friesway. These are obviously mock-up pictures because at the moment it's still a field, <laughs> uh, but this is what we're expecting it to look like when it's built uh, based on many, many, many lengthy meetings with the architects, with 
uh, our agencies involved, and again, CSS are the experts. They will be staffing this uh, facility 24 seven. 30 to 90 days is our expectation. So not, not brief, but not forever. Uh, obviously we want this for people to come out, get habilitation and rehabilitation. And I point that out because I think we often say rehab, but many of our individuals got ill as we know, if it's schizophrenia, they may have gotten ill just as they were about to start being adults uh, and do all those adulting type responsibilities. And so they never had habilitation, let alone to be rehabbed. So we, we need to teach them, how do you work in a kitchen and make your food? So we'll have a teaching kitchen uh, there, other materials, computers, et cetera. Um, it looks like a beautiful space. We have engaged uh, Dr. Fred Fries's family. Uh, so Dr. Penny Fries, uh, at least one of his daughters as well, uh, have been part of this. So they've been able to help us look at what should it look like in mostly in the interior interior designs so that it has enough of a homey uh, atmosphere for people to really recover uh, in a peaceful way. And we are keeping, you can sort of tell from some of the woodwork there, keeping a bit of a uh, outdoor feel to it, right? Because it's going to be out right across the street from the National Park, uh, the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. So we're trying to keep in that theme, the colors are in that, greens and browns and blues kind of colors uh, some gray obviously exter exterior so we're we're thrilled we believe it'll take about a year to build it's being built from scratch there's nothing there right now uh and uh we will then have a grand opening no doubt uh that many people will be invited to that uh and start helping people in a way that's missing right now in the continuum So there's our references and so forth. You'll get that slide set. Um, hopefully that gives you a picture. Again, there's lots of other stuff that can be done, uh, but we I feel like we're, we're making some dents in that in Summit County. Having said that, that does not mean that when I drive to work, I don't see people standing on the street corner with a sign, right? So it's they, unfortunately, despite all of what I described, we still have this issue. Uh, some people say, oh, no, no, I choose to be homeless. When they